In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Amen. The grace and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with each and every one of you this evening as we gather in the Cathedral Church to celebrate these sacred mysteries for the forgiveness of our sins. It's a joy to be here after a hiatus of over a year, but maybe even more, but it's a joy, especially as we have with us a special guest who has come in from the Far East, Mr. David Tam, who is the founder of the Jin Zhao Fellowship in Hong Kong and has many contacts in China itself. And this liturgy this evening, which has been celebrated in its entirety, is being recorded for the purposes of a future faithful, God willing, of the Church of the East in Hong Kong and China and elsewhere. So we pray for, and I ask you to pray for that mission, that it would uh, begin by the grace of God and that the Lord will send out servants and hirelings for his harvest. Today is the third Sunday of the season of Annunciation and the Holy Gospel, which we have heard is from the preaching of St. Luke, the first chapter, verses 57 to 80. And today, according to the liturgical calendar of the church, we celebrate the birth of St. John the Baptist, who is known as the herald who introduced the coming of the Messiah, the Son of God. The importance of John the Baptist, who is called the forerunner, meaning he is the one who declares ahead of time the coming of the King, of the promised Messiah, is that it was his divinely given ministry to prepare the way before the chosen one of the Lord, who we know as the Messiah, who would save his people from their sins and would save us from our sins. About 400 years before the birth of John, the prophet Malachi, who as you will see is the last prophet of the Old Testament, he's the last book is that of Malachi, which has only four chapters, prophesied concerning the birth and the coming of this forerunner, this herald who would announce the coming of a great king. And Malachi says this in chapter 3, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will come and prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. That messenger was St. John the Baptist. God had a plan for humanity. And the plan was to save mankind from the darkness of Satan, of sin, and death. However, according to God's great economy, his dabranuta, his dispensation, the Lord makes use of both ordinary and extraordinary means to bring about his divine economy of salvation. He makes use of his own divine might and his wisdom on the one hand, and yet he also makes use of the feebleness and the weakness of man on the other. From the one perspective, God initiates salvation. Salvation is an act that comes primarily and initially from God. But it doesn't end there, because God also requires our cooperation with his goodness and his call to salvation. And in requiring our cooperation, God still gives respect to our freedom, to the freedom of our will, which he himself has given us. Therefore, salvation requires what is known as a synergy, which means a cooperation of the will of God and the will of man. God will not save us against our will, but he will save us despite our sinfulness. The birth of St. John, who is known as the Baptist, is an extraordinary event which God uses as part of his plan of salvation. It is an initiative of God, first and foremost, and yet he also makes use of the weakness of man, as we see demonstrated in his parents, Zechariah the priest and Elizabeth, who are both old and barren people. On the one hand, we have Zechariah, who is a priest and who is well-versed in the law and who ministered before God in the temple. But we also see his weakness 
when he is not able to fully accept and understand the message with the, which the angel Gabriel enunciated to him from the Lord when he saw him nine months previous to the event we're celebrating today when he was at the altar of incense. Zechariah became dumbfounded at the words of Gabriel, the archangel. What, has God heard my prayers now in my old age? He and Elizabeth were actually preparing for their death. They were not preparing to be parents. They were not prepared, or they, they were not preparing to see the fulfillment of what they had prayed for many, many decades when they were younger. They had given up hope on that, and they prepared for the end of their life. This was beyond Zechariah's comprehension in his faith. He simply could not accept it when he heard the words of glad tidings from Gabriel. And then, on the other hand, there's Elizabeth, the good and the faithful woman. But how could she give birth to a child in her old age when she was known by everyone to be barren? How could her barren womb spring forth with child? Where was the promise of God when both Zechariah and Elizabeth were in their younger years asking for children as a blessing from the Lord? Had God forgotten about them when they prayed for these things? Had God put them down by not responding to their prayers? These were questions and doubts that went through their mind for many years, and they suffered because of it. But what they really could not grasp was the fact that God had deemed them to use their weakness and unworthiness and their barrenness and their old age to be part of God's marvelous plan in bringing about the Messiah, the promised Savior. They did not know at that time what important role their child John was foreordained to play in God's incomprehensible theodrama, if we may call it so, which he planned for humanity. They did not recognize and could not grasp that their child, who was a gift from God, and that's what the name John means, the mercy of God, he gave them a gift by being merciful to them, would be the messenger before the coming of Christ the Savior. And this was brought about through a miraculous birth uh, of this child. For a few moments, I want to quote a beautiful exposition from St. Ephraim, Mar Ephraim the Great, one of the great theologians of the Church of the East, who contrasts and compares the child who was from Elizabeth and the child who was from Mary. And he says this, The elderly and the barren Elizabeth gave birth to the last of the prophets, and Mary, a young girl, to the Lord of the angels. The daughter of Aaron, meaning Elizabeth, gave birth to the voice in the desert, but the daughter of David to the strong Lord of the earth. The barren one gave birth to him who remits sins, because John was of the priestly order, but the virgin gave birth to him who takes away sin. Elizabeth gave birth to him who reconciled people through repentance, but Mary gave birth to him who purified the lands of uncleanliness. The elderly one lit a lamp in the house of Jacob, his father, for this lamp itself was John, while the younger one, meaning Mary, lit the son of justice, prophesied in Malachi, for all the nations. The angel announced to Zechariah so that the slain one would proclaim the envied one. He who was to baptize with water would proclaim him who would baptize with fire and the Holy Spirit. What a beautiful comparison between the barren woman and the virgin young girl Mary. When the time for John's birth had come, he was circumcised on the eighth day of his birth in accordance with the Jewish law. And as the friends and the families and the neighbors, as is the custom when a child is born, were gathered, they all had expected him to be called either Zechariah after his father or of a man who was close to their kindred. 
But Elizabeth, the barren, old-aged woman, said, It shall not be so. He will be called John. The meaning of John is the mercy, the chnana of God. For God had mercy upon his servants, Zechariah the priest and Elizabeth. Of course, they had to ask the father. Unfortunately, at the day, the testimony of a woman wasn't accepted. But when they made signs to Zechariah, and remember Zechariah was silent for nine months, he couldn't speak, because he doubted the words of the angel. And just imagine how happy Elizabeth was during those nine months. But Zechariah asked the tablet, and he said, his name is John. Because at the birth of his son, the son of his old age, he realized what the angel had proclaimed to him nine months previous to that. And Zechariah, which of course, by the way, the, word Zachar- the name Zechariah means the Lord remembered. And he remembered Zechariah in, in, the, in the, uh, the winter of his, of his life. When he was about to leave this life, God had remembered him and he remembered his prayers and he granted what he had, re- what he had accepted and requested of the Lord. Zechariah spoke a beautiful hymn of praise, which is known as the Benedictus, which means, it's the beginning of the the song of Zechariah, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. He understood that this was an act of God, that John was not any ordinary child. And we see a similar hymn of praise, that of Mary, which is known as the Magnificat, which is found in Luke chapter 1, which is Mary's hymn of praise to God for the greatness which he showed to her and to her lowly estate when he made her worthy to be the mother of the Son of God incarnate. Zechariah realizes that the promises of God to Abraham are about to be fulfilled. God had not forgotten. He had not forgotten Zechariah. He had not forgotten Elizabeth. He had not forgotten his promises, which were much older, going back to the time of Abraham, the friend and the believer, the friend of God who believed in God, and with whom God made a covenant, saying, by your seed, in your seed, as a singular, meaning one, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, referring to Christ. After praising God for his goodness and for remembering his promises, Then Zechariah does something strange. He turns to his eight-day-old son and he speaks to him. Now, mind you, when we see a small child of a few days old, usually we make faces and smile and do the goo-goos and the gagas. But Zechariah didn't do that. He knew that even though John was his son, but he was much greater than that. God had made him the forerunner, the proclaimer of the coming of the Christ. He turns to this eight-day-old child and he says these words of prophecy under inspiration from the Holy Spirit. After giving thanks and praise to God for remembering his mercies and his oaths and promises, and he says, and you, child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. Zechariah couldn't have said that if it was not received was not revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. For you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways and to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins. At that point, Zechariah fully realizes why the angel came to him and why he bound his tongue for nine months and why the child was born in his deep old age. He had not given up. The words of Zechariah, of this old, old father to this young child, to this prophet, and the mystery that would be fulfilled with John later, he would of course go to the desert and live there for about 30 years before Christ came and he proclaimed the coming of Jesus. And he had the gifts of priesthood, of prophecy, of prophethood, and of martyrdom. He was a priest after the order of his father, Zechariah, 
because the priesthood went from father to son. And he was a prophet because God had anointed him as a prophet while he was in the womb of his mother, Elizabeth. And he was a martyr because he was killed by the son of Herod the Great for condemning the son of Herod who had transgressed the law. And he prepared the way for the Lord. Zechariah comes to understand the significance of what happened in the temple nine months previously. And he understood now why God had not granted his prayers when he had prayed and asked for them. The lesson to be learned from today's gospel reading is taught by Zechariah, this old father of John, this old priest who otherwise was preparing for his departure from this world. Though he was a priest who served at the altar of the Lord, well versed in the scriptures, though not understanding fully the plan of God, because God brought them about through acts which were beyond human understanding. He hadn't understood previously the words of the angel Gabriel, and he could not at that time understand what it meant to receive a son in his old age when he was preparing to die. Many times and often in life, we too do not understand the plan and the will of God for us in life. Events and circumstances which are not able to be comprehended by us leave a heavy burden on our hearts and on our souls. They try us, they test our faith, and they shake our very being. But we must always remember that God is true and faithful to his word. The promises which the Lord makes will always be brought to fulfillment, but there's a catch. He does it in his own time. And God's time is the perfect time. It's the proper time. It's the most beneficial time. It is the time through which if we can submit our wills to God, we will receive grace and mercy from him. Zechariah and Elizabeth learned this lesson the hard way. They had to wait all of those years for God to hear their prayer and to give this child, which not only they rejoiced at his birth, but everyone who heard about the birth of John rejoiced because they knew it was something from God. God some, gave them something which was more than what they had asked for. They asked for a son to be a blessing, as it was thought at the time that children, of course, are a blessing from the Lord. And according to the prescription of the laws, the wife and the, the husband who did not have a child were despised by the people. They even had to offer their sacrifices at the very end of everyone, at the last, at the last of the line. Zechariah probably even served the priesthood after all of the priests who had children. But God's hand was at work in this great mystery. During this holy season of Annunciation of Subara, as we prepare to receive the mystery of the incarnation of the Son of God in the flesh, we see the will of God unfolding through a series of miraculous and marvelous events untold before. In commemorating the birth of he who was announced on the first Sunday of this season, we see the unfolding and the bringing to fulfillment of God's many promises. The promise was that a child would be born who is the savior of the world. That is the ultimate promise of God to man. However, this divine mystery is brought about and realized by means of both a divine and human agency. God works with humanity. He helps us to cooperate with his will. He does not work against it. At the birth of Christ, we have God and man meeting at the same point. Divinity and humanity meet face to face. What we've learned today in the gospel, Zechariah the old priest teaches us, as one who was versed in the law, who served God, who could not understand what God tried to tell him through the agency of the angel, but he saw it and understood it and accepted it and received grace because of it when he learned to submit to the will of God and to be patient when praying and beseeching God's mercy. 
Often we don't understand what God has in store for us and what he's planned for us and what in his infinite wisdom he would have us do. Events and circumstances are too great for us to understand. But the Lord is true and faithful. If we can understand that and accept it through faith, we, like Zechariah and Elizabeth, will receive great joy and fulfillment in the Spirit. The birth of John the Baptist, who is the last of the Old Testament prophets, and indeed he stands in between both the New and the Old Testament, teaches us this hard lesson. We have only to submit ourselves to God's will and to his love, no matter the circumstances we experience in life and encounter. I want to sum up with a quote from the book of Ecclesiastes from the third chapter, which mentions and emphasizes the steadfast faithfulness of God. He has made everything beautiful in its own time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it, and nothing can be taken away from it. God does it so that men will revere him. So that men will revere him. Amen. Amen.